Hi guys, uh, this is Dr. G here and in this particular video we will talk about uh, nuclear chemistry. And uh, nuclear chemistry is specially applicable in health science uh, which is uh, very important to most of your careers in, in the future. And uh, usually nuclear chemistry aspects are highly utilized in imaging techniques which are used to diagnose and treat medical problems. So basically patients uh, are usually given a radioactive tracer that emits uh, radiations, uh, most probably gamma radiations that can be detected by a radiation scanner which, uh, which will then develop uh, the radiation image into uh, an analytical tool, tool to analyze a, a, a desired area of the body. Okay, so that is how usually nuclear chemistry is used in uh, health science but of course there are many different variations of applications and uses for uh, radiation chemistry or nuclear chemistry. Uh, one of the most important things that you need to know about radiation chemistry or to understand radiation chemistry is the atomic symbol. Okay, you need to remember or you need to understand the concepts of atomic symbol. Okay, and uh, in here I have given you an example for an atomic symbol. Okay. Uh, this is the atomic symbol for iodine, uh, iodine 131. Okay, this is the atomic symbol for iodine 131. Some people write it as I131. Okay, so basically in an atomic symbol, you are given with three uh, types of in information. The first information that they will give you in an atomic symbol is the symbol of element. Okay, symbol of element. So basically in here it is iodine. So the symbol is I. And then the next piece of information that is important in an atomic symbol is the mass number. Okay, mass number is actually the superscripted number that you see uh, in an atomic symbol. And this is the larger number out of the two numbers. Okay, and mass number, as you remember from our previous, previous discussions, uh, tells you how many protons and neutrons you have in that particular atom. Okay, mass number basically tells you the number of protons and neutrons that you have in a particular atom or isotope. Okay, and then the other number that is present in uh, the atomic symbol is atomic number. Atomic number is the subscripted number, okay, which is usually the lower number of the two numbers. And atomic number represents the number of protons. Atomic number represents the number of protons. So basically, by looking at the uh, atomic symbol you you should be able to predict three uh, subatomic particles or you should be able to uh, uh, determine the number of uh, each subatomic particle so by looking at the atomic number you know how many protons you have which is basically 53 for this particular isotope and then the number of protons are going to be equal to number of electrons in an atom so you're going to have 53 electrons and then uh, <clears throat> of course uh, if you take the difference between mass number and uh, mass number and atomic number you should be able to get the number of neutrons so in this case the number of neutrons will be 131 minus 53 okay 131 minus 53 53 is the number of protons from the atomic number and of course 131 is the mass number which is the sum of protons and neutrons so if you want to figure out the number of neutrons of course subtract the atomic number from mass number so we talked about all these things i just uh, reminded you what we discussed uh, when we talk about uh, atomic number in a previous lesson i hope you remember now okay because it is very important to and understand the atomic number principle because we will be using it readily in the future okay all right so let's talk about this okay let's talk about uh, radi radioactivity or let's talk about uh, radiation and isotopes okay so you already know what are isotopes right isotopes are uh, atoms of the same element okay the isotopes are atoms of the same element with uh, different number of neutrons okay isotopes are atoms of the same uh, same element with different number of neutrons which means these atoms of the same element uh, have 
different mass numbers okay when you change the number of neutrons of course it is going to change the mass number okay so that's that's called isotopes we learned about it before and uh, the other important thing about these isotopes is that when you have elements with atomic numbers greater than 20 okay usually you are going to have uh, one or more isotopes that are unstable okay so when you i mean this is not the case all the time but usually when the atomic number of an element is greater than 20 those elements usually have one or more isotopes with unstable nuclei what is unstable in chemistry unstable means they are high in energy so you can have certain isotopes of an element that are high in energy okay so if a certain species is high in energy we say it is unstable and it is waiting to release its energy right it is waiting to release its energy it's like you know an unstable person if a person is unstable he will you know get into trouble very easily he will start fights with people you know do something weird and then get into trouble because you know you have very high energies right so you have to use it to something right so that is why we say they are unstable if your energy is high most probably you are going to get into trouble or do something using those energies right so uh, when you have these unstable isotopes okay in elements what they do is they they try to become stable by releasing that extra energy okay so when you have these unstable isotopes they try to release the instability or release the extra energy uh, and uh, become stable okay so how do they release their energies okay let's say you have an isotope with high energy okay and here is your isotope with high energy and then uh, let's say this axis x axis is energy and uh, it wants to get down to a lower energy state okay so now it is in e2 state let's say it is high in energy and it wants to get to this e1 state which is less in energy okay so if it wants to go from this high energy e2 to low energy e1 he needs to release its energy okay so if you want to get to the e1 state the low energy state you need to release your energy all that instability through uh, uh, radiation okay so this right here is radiation okay so basically when an unstable nucleus okay releases its energy uh, as radiation during the process of becoming stable we say that uh, the isotope is radioactive we say that the isotope is radioactive okay so certain isotopes can stabilize through emission of radiation so therefore we say that the isotope is radioactive or we can label the isotope as a radioactive isotope okay radioactive isotope when if someone asks you what is a radioactive isotope it is basically and uh, unstable it is basically an unstable isotope which releases the extra energy uh, as radiation during the stabilization process okay so this radiation may be uh, uh, of a uh, few kinds okay the radiation uh, can take uh, the form of a few different types okay you uh, and in this slide i have given you four different uh, possibilities of radiations okay these extra radiations could be emitted as uh, alpha particles or beta particles sometimes positrons or just as pure energy gamma radiations okay so th these are some of the ways that radioisotopes release their extra energy okay it could be alpha beta positron or gamma radiations all right so basically once again an, an isotope of an element that emits radiation is called radioisotope okay so basically when this radiation is released from a radioisotope okay uh, they of course release their extra energy and become stable okay not only that uh, during this uh, radiation or during this uh, radioactive decay 
okay they may undergo changes such as you know they may change in the number of protons okay or they might change in the number of uh, neutrons or number of electrons so uh, isotopes could change okay during this uh, radioactive process okay uh, and if they basically change their number of protons they are no longer the same element right they are no longer the same element why because every element has a unique atomic number if you change the number of protons that means you you no longer have the same number of protons which means you don't have the uh, same number of atomic number i mean you, you don't have the same atomic number like before right so if you are changing your atomic number you are a completely different atom okay so in radioactive isotopes you might see atoms converting from one element to a completely different element okay mainly because they could change the number of protons okay so we will talk about these things in more detail later on and uh, uh when, when you are uh, studying about uh, radioactive isotopes of course the atomic symbol is important but sometimes you know writing the atomic symbol could be a little bit challenging okay mainly because you have a subscripted number and uh, you know a uh, superscripted number so i mean as you can imagine it is hard to write okay so rather than giving you the full atomic symbol therefore different textbooks or even i myself could use easier techniques to I label isotopes okay rather than giving you all the information such as as uh, element symbol mass number and atomic number i will or textbooks might just give you the element symbol and mass number okay so uh, something like i131 okay which is basically the same uh, iodine 131 isotope but you know you you don't have to spoon feed the atomic number all the time right if you have the access to a periodic table you can figure out the atomic number if you know the element symbol am i correct so i mean therefore you know rather than uh, giving you the full atomic symbol some people might just give you uh the element name or the element symbol with the mass number okay so don't get alarmed uh, but uh, this is very easier way of representing uh, atoms okay or isotopes all right okay so here are some of the stable and radioactive isotopes for uh, few different elements okay few different elements so in here i have examples for magnesium iodine and uranium okay so um, most people think that magnesium i mean no we no we don't usually talk about radioactive magnesium right so magnesium has a very stable isotope uh, which is magnesium 24 okay which is magnesium 24 but actually magnesium also has uh highly radioactive isotopes which is magnesium 23 and magnesium 27 okay uh so when you take a piece of magnesium a, a piece of magnesium foil you not only have the very stable magnesium 24 odds are that you are going to see or you are going to have some magnesium 23 and magnesium 27 which are radioactive isotopes uh but here's the thing i mean uh naturally these magnesium 23 and 27 are not highly abundant okay so uh, a piece of magnesium could could be less radioactive than you think okay so uh, not only uh, i mean that is why i mean we don't use any precautions when 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 touching a magnesium piece right because the abundance of magnesium 23 and 27 are very very small as compared to magnesium 24 okay and when it comes to iodine iodine also has three very common isotopes and of course the stable isotope is the more common one which is iodine 130 127 and then uh, you also have radioactive isotopes uh, of iodine which are basically iodine 125 and iodine 131 okay uh, but i mean one of the very common uh, radioactive compounds are uranium right so most people know about uranium because of their radioactivity and if you take uranium you will realize that uranium has no uh, stable isotopes okay so if you have a piece of uranium 
hundred percent of that piece of uranium is going to be radioactive. Okay, so that is why uranium is very very important. Okay, every uranium atom is radioactive, and it has no stable isotopes, and then it has two very common radioactive isotopes, uranium two thirty five and uranium two thirty eight. All right, so these are only some of the examples, but there are so many other examples in nature which we will see in the future. Okay. All right. So now let's talk about types of radiation. Let's talk about types of radiation. In here, I'm going to talk about four types of radiations in more detail. Okay. I'm going to talk about four types of radiation in more detail. What I want you to do is when I talk about these four types of radiations. I want you to remember their name, okay? I want you to remember their name, and I also want you to remember their symbol, okay? I want you to remember their name and symbol. Believe me, if you can remember the name and the symbol, that is all you need to remember in this chapter, and everything else is going to be extremely easy. Everything else is going to be extremely easy, okay? All right. So let's talk about the first type of radiation, which is alpha particle. Okay, which is alpha particle. Okay, remember the name. And usually, alpha particles, uh, the symbol is known as uh, He four. Okay, so alpha particles are helium atoms, of course. Okay, helium. It has a helium nucleus. You can say it has a helium nucleus, but of course, helium has two electrons, but uh, it has a two plus plus charge. So both electrons have. Left helium. Okay, so uh, uh, therefore, alpha particles have a plus two charge. Alpha particles have a plus two charge. Okay, alpha particles have a uh, excuse me plus two charge. And remember the symbol. This right here is the symbol. So please remember that. Okay, it is important you, that you remember the symbol of alpha particle. Once again, in this alpha particle, as you can see, the mass number is four. Mass number is four, which means you have two protons and two neutrons. Two protons and two neutrons. Usually, the subscripted number is the atomic number. Okay, it is usually the atomic number. But uh, when we are labeling uh, radioisotopes, we usually use this uh, bottom number or this subscripted number. We use this uh, subscripted number to identify the charge. Okay. This is all. Uh, this is usually the charge. So this number right here, okay, at the bottom, the number two, gives you the charge of alpha particle. Okay, uh, so it it is a little bit tricky now, okay, because up until now we we thought that this um uh, uh, this subscripted number is the atomic number, uh, but. Uh, now we are going to learn that this number could be used to represent the charge of our subatomic particles. Uh, I would say you can you can uh, think it like this. You can use this uh, number, the subscripted number or the atomic number, uh, to to get both the charge and the atomic number. If it, if it if it makes sense, I will explain you that in more detail in a minute. Okay. All right. So the next particle that we are going to talk about is beta particles. Remember the name and the symbol, which is right here. Okay. So beta particle, and uh, beta particles are basically high energy electrons. High energy electrons, and uh, as you know by now, electrons are ten thousand times, approximately ten thousand times lighter than protons and neutrons, and therefore their mass is insignificant as compared to. Proton mass or neutron mass. So therefore, electrons does not count towards the mass number. Okay, mass number is only in the number of no neutrons and protons. So electrons does not contribute to the mass number. So therefore, uh, in here the mass number is what zero. Mass number is zero, and also electrons have a negative charge. Electrons have a negative charge. So therefore, uh, in this. Uh, Symbol, you have a minus one charge, minus one charge, minus one charge. Okay, all right. So that is the symbol of uh, beta particles. Remember that. Okay, so we learn two uh, types of radiations and their symbols. Okay, I want you to remember both of them. And then uh, we are going to talk about two other particles. Okay, so the third particle is called positron. Uh, positron is an example for antimatter. Okay, so 
positron is an anti electron it is just like an electron but the only difference is that it has a positive charge electrons are negatively charged but positrons are positively charged okay so uh, for the, for for the subscripted number you have a plus one because the charge is positive right and then of course uh, positrons are just like electrons when it comes to mass okay so the mass number is zero okay mass number is zero so remember the symbol remember the symbol for uh, positrons okay remember the symbol for positrons and the third kind that uh, uh, the fourth kind that we are going to talk about are gamma radiations okay these are the most common radiation for most people why because i mean this is very commonly used in movies okay or at least sci-fi movies okay if you remember incredible hulk okay incredible hulk is created because of the gamma rays i mean here's the thing movie makers and storytellers go wild on this gamma radiation mainly because they are extremely high in energies they are extremely high in energies so most of the times scientists couldn't even predict what is going to happen if you are exposed to a uh, lot of gamma radiations in in a small time period okay so if you are exposed to a high dose of gamma radiations uh, most people don't even know what's going to happen it could be uh, lethal or something more than that that is why you know that is why most of the movie makers use these gamma radiations they are extremely high in energy not only they are very high in energy they have no mass or no charge okay they have no mass or no charge so the symbol has zero for both mass number and the charge okay uh, so that is how you write the symbol for gamma radiations okay so remember that as well other than uh, these four radiations you might want to remember the protons and neutron uh, symbols okay because they can also be used as radiations in chemistry okay so we already talked about alpha beta positron and gamma radiations so protons have the symbol hydrogen okay so i mean uh, uh, hydrogen and the mass number is of course one uh, because you have one proton so the mass number is one no neutrons and then the uh, number of, the charge of a proton is plus one so uh, the bottom number will also be uh, a one okay so uh, and for neutrons uh, and also uh, for protons i mean the atomic number is also one right so that is why we have a one here and for for neutrons for neutrons of course neutron will contribute to the mass number so you have a one as a mass number and then also neutrons will not have a charge will not have a charge and it does not count against it does not count against uh, the atomic number so the subscripted number is actually zero okay zero so uh, i i would say that uh, when you study you might want to start studying from this slide okay why because if you remember the names of the types of radiations if you remember the names of the uh, types of radiations and they are symbol and if you know how to understand the symbol which is basically mass number and charge you are golden okay that is the only thing that you need to remember in this chapter and then everything else is self-explanatory if you know simple math like you know addition and subtraction everything else is going to be easy so if if you can do the you know simple addition and subtraction work you are going to be uh, really good in this chapter okay so even though you know the name itself says that nuclear chemistry and most people are terrified and honestly i also thought that i'm going to fail this chapter because you know it, it seems hard but it is not okay honestly this is the easiest chapter in chemistry okay this is the easiest chapter in chemistry all right let's see if you could do this sample problem okay let me explain you how you do this while you are working on a video i want you to pause the video and then uh, try the sample problems and listen to my explanation okay all right let's start identify and write the symbol for each of the following types of radiation okay which radiation contains two protons and two neutrons of course that is alpha particles that is alpha particles so this is, it is h e helium 2 4 okay uh, helium ion okay so that is alpha particles and uh, 
has a mass number of zero which means you know it is uh it is either uh it is either uh electron which means uh uh it is either electron or positron or it could be gamma particle okay so those are the only three radiations that we learned has a mass number of zero it could be the electrons which is beta particle and then it, it could be positron anti-electron or positron and then uh, the other radiation with a mass number zero is gamma particle but of course gamma has no charge but this radiation has a minus one charge so only electrons or so beta particles have a minus one charge so this is beta right beta all right so this is these are the two answers all right so i think i have another study check okay so identify and write the symbol for the type of radiation that has mass number of zero perfect so it's either electron or beta positron or uh, gamma but it has a charge of plus one so this should be a positron this should be a positron which is beta plus one zero okay all right so far so good right so remember the six types of radiations and their symbols and understand the symbols you are going to be golden in this chapter okay all right with that being said you can try this study check at home okay but at your own time and see if you can answer this okay all right so why are these radiations so important especially in biology okay why why do people get scared when they hear the word radiations i mean we don't want to go out in a sunny day without any sun cream sun sunscreen on right so why 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 do we what are what are the biological effects of radiations of course radiations are high in energy they are high in energy these radiations are high in energy so therefore if they hit a certain molecule they could i mean like you know a molecule in our body they could uh, basically uh, help form an unstable ion from a stable molecule okay they could uh, basically uh, make an unstable molecule let's say such as water okay and they will knock an electron out from that stable water molecule and then it could form an unstable uh, ion such as h2o plus okay water is h2o but when you remove an electron from water it becomes h2o plus right so h2o plus is not stable water is extremely stable but h2o plus is unstable because you know uh, oxygen has uh, oxygen does not have eight electrons so it is it is unstable okay so basically these radiations can make our stable molecules unstable ions and because of i mean they can also do this to very important molecules in our body such as you know proteins dnas and rnas so if our proteins dnas or rnas if they change okay our cells could undergo things like you know rapid uh, cell division and sometimes you know this could be this could lead to things like cancer okay so that is why we are worried about radiation such as you know gamma radiations or x-rays okay some people are even scared of getting x-rays which is reasonable which is reasonable but we but we will talk about x-rays later on and uh, these radiations uh, even um, uv radiation right Ru uv radiations they they are especially harmful because they are high energy radiations such as you know uh, they are not as high as x-rays or gamma radiations but still uh uv radiations can come from sunlight and then they can harm us okay they have sufficient energies to change our molecules right and then you know uh molecules in our you know body changes it could lead to cancer or even you know they could harm our future generations why because if if they change our reproductive cells okay then uh, those mutated reproductive cells could form a mutated kid or, or a baby and then uh, you know these changes can uh, uh, go to the future even okay so that is why you know nuclear weapons are very destructive they can not only damage the current population 
they can also impact future generations okay i mean they can change uh, uh, future de generations to years to come okay so that is why nuclear radiation is extremely disruptive okay they are extremely disruptive so how do you protect yourself from nuclear radiation so, okay so protecting yourself from nuclear radiation radiations could be easier than you think okay so alpha particles as you know mass number is four so out of all the uh, radiations that we talked about of course alpha particles are extremely heavy okay so they are they are the heaviest i would say as compared to things like you know uh, gamma radiations or uh, electrons they are thousands of times heavier okay so alpha particles are extremely heavy because they are very heavy they they are less mobile i mean they are like this very heavy i mean it's like a huge human right when you are extremely huge okay most most of the times or odds are that you are not going to be very mobile right so alpha particles are not very mobile so they they have they don't travel fast and they don't travel long so protecting yourself from alpha particles are easy by wearing simple clothing and then things like paper could help you uh, you know uh, could help you from getting exposed to alpha particles and then uh, if you have beta particles okay beta particles are lightweight and negatively charged of course they have high energies but if you wear a second layer of uh, clothing like, such as a lab coat you can easily avoid uh, beta particles from penetrating into your body okay so wear a lab coat to get protected from beta particles and maybe things like gloves and you know shields but uh, to to get you protected from gamma radiations is very hard why because they have no charge no mass so they are extremely high in energy so if you want to get protected or shielded from gamma radiations you need a good barrier a thick concrete wall or something like you know a thick lead shield okay most of the nuclear plants that use gamma radiations uh, exist underground okay exist underground why because you know if something happens on uh, to a, a gamma radiation plant uh, on on the ground i mean it could be lethal for a huge population so most of these uh, gamma radiation plants tend to be underground at least the gamma radiation source so that you know if something happens if there is a leak okay there will be a thick concrete wall or a lead wall to uh, shield uh, those gamma radiations uh or shield us from those gamma radiations okay all right so of course if you are working with radiate uh, radiations you can always uh, limit the amount of time that you spend around a radioactive source especially this is true for radioactive uh, uh per, i mean the personnel who who works with radioactive sources okay they they have shorter work hours and then also you don't always work around a radioactive source you only work on a few hours or hours or few minutes per day okay on near a radioactive source so you can always limit the amount of time you spend around these radiations and also you can always increase the distance okay it is it is it is a good idea to keep your distance okay so social distancing helps right exactly so uh, if you increase the distance between the radiation source and yourself you are going to be better protected because most radiations do, don't travel too far okay and therefore you know the chance of you getting exposed to those radiations are low if you keep the distance but of course uh every uh, radiation is different so if you talk about alpha particles which are very heavy uh, uh particles with a plus 2 charge okay their travel distance is what 2 to 4 cm which is like 2 inches okay which is like 2 inches so if you have a alpha particle source on your table if you if you keep like you know 1 feet away from the radiation source you are fine okay you are fine uh and also alpha particles have a very small tissue depth which means you know they only travel very small uh distance in your tissues so your skin is more than enough to help you and of course if you have a, a small layer of clothing on you i mean it can easily protect you protect you from alpha particles because they have a low penetration depth okay so of course alpha particles are really dangerous if they are inside your body because it is like you know a huge uh, 
radiation particle inside your body could could do a lot of damage but of course you know it is easy to protect yourself from alpha particles okay by mainly because they have a low travel distance and then also their penetration depth into our skin is very small okay into our skin is very small okay and uh beta particles of course they have a uh, 200 to 300 centimeter travel distance which means like two to three yards okay or two to three meters of course uh, uh therefore you know keeping the distance uh, between a beta particle and uh, yourself could easily help you okay could easily help you and also uh, they, uh, they have a higher or much larger tissue depth so of course they can penetrate into your body okay into your blood and inside your body easily because they have a four to five milliliter mi sorry millimeter uh, tissue depth okay so definitely you need a couple of layers of protection that is why it is recommended to wear heavy clothing or lab co coats and gloves to protect yourselves okay all right so let's talk about gamma radiations of course they are extremely dangerous because they are very high in energies and their travel distance is like half a kilometer okay so they travel uh, larger distances okay they cover larger distances and then if you want to protect yourself if you want to shield yourself you should at least need a good thick uh, concrete layer or a lead lead shield okay all right so let's see if you could do the study check what type of radiation will be blocked by each of the following if you use a lead shield it will block uh, all the radiations including gamma radiation so gamma radiation will be shielded from lead paper and clothing will protect you from alpha particles okay paper and clothing uh, will basically help you from alpha particles all right now comes to the more interesting part or the easier part in our chapter which is nuclear reactions okay so this is how it works if you learn the concept one time it is going to help you repeatedly okay so learn this in one sitting and you will be fine okay learn this in one sitting and you will be fine all right so in this part of the chapter I want you to learn how to write a balanced nuclear equation and some people are like oh my god we didn't even talk about balancing chemical reactions right so how are we going to learn how to balance nuclear reactions but hey let's say you don't know how to balance chemical reactions you are more than fine okay balancing nuclear reactions are way different and way easier so I will teach you that in a minute and then uh, uh, let's get to an example okay so when balancing nuclear equations okay of course you need to uh, treat mass number and atomic number separately in here i have a, i have an example of course in nuclear reactions unlike in chemical reactions uh, regular chemical reactions we use both the mass number we use both the mass number and atomic number okay they are both important okay so we we are going to use both mass number and atomic number so every component that is involved in a nuclear equation should have all three of these components the element symbol the mass number and atomic number and then what you do is uh, you treat mass number and atomic number separately so in other words you treat the mass number as a separate equation and you treat the atomic number as a separate equation okay as a separate equation so when balancing nuclear equations what you try to do is you try to balance you try to balance the mass number sum and also you try to balance the atomic number sum separately okay in this example as you can see uh, you have a, a nuclear equation and in this uh, of course you have a left hand side okay which is this one and then right hand side and those two are separated from an arrow of course to in nuclear in chemical equations or any in any chemistry equations we are using an arrow to separate reactants so these are your reactants from products okay so you are using an arrow to separate reactants from products so what we try to do in uh, balancing these uh, uh, reactants and products is that we are trying to balance the mass number 
of reactants to mass number of products okay so in here as you can see the mass number of reactants are going to be 251 okay 251 and mass number of products are going to be 247 and 4 which is again 251 so these two will add up to 251 so this reaction is balanced so when you are writing equations you should always try to balance the mass number sum between reactants and products and secondly we want to balance we want to balance the atomic number sum of course in the reactant side the atomic number sum is 98 and on the product side the atomic number sum is 96 plus 2 which is once again 98 which is once again 98 okay all right so you try to balance the mass number sum and atomic number sum that is what that is all you need to do so in the future what i'm going to do is i'm going to give you a reaction with one of these species missing Okay, I, basically I will remove one of these species and then I will ask you to fill in the blank, okay? So you will, you will use the mass number sum and atomic number sum and then figure out the missing piece of the puzzle. That is all we are going to do, okay? That is all we are going to do. It is easier to show you how to do it rather than explaining it, okay? So let's do an example. So in here, we have an alpha decay as an example, alpha decay, which means in this reaction you are emitting alpha particles in this reaction you are emitting alpha particles so right here you have an alpha particle so you are getting alpha particle as a product yeah okay so you are getting product alpha particles so therefore these reactions are known as alpha decays if someone asks you what are alpha decays that is a radioactive reaction where you are getting alpha particles as products okay alpha particles as products in here we are using uranium 238 uranium 238 as our reactant okay so here is your uranium 238 okay and then uh, the product of course will have alpha particle which is helium 42 and then the other product will be uh, thorium okay thorium 234 okay 234 so and if you check you will realize that the mass number sum and atomic number sum number sum matches between reactants and products okay so mass number sum and atomic number sum is equal in these two reactions all right so here is a nice study check which we can do in order to understand uh, uh, this uh, alpha decay okay all right, so I, what I want you to do is I want you to uh, I want you to uh, see if you could do this without my help. So pause the video now and then see if you could do this one. OK, pause the video now and try this one. All right, so let's do this. Let's do this. OK, so in this question, I'm asking you to write the balanced nuclear equation for the alpha decay of polonium 213. OK. This is what I want you to do. Uh, write the uh, alpha decay of polonium 213, 214. So what you have is polonium 214. Okay, let me let me download a periodic table because I don't have one. But you should have one with you right now, right? All right. Okay, so you check uh, polonium uh, from the periodic table. Okay, you check the polonium from uh, periodic table and then you figure out the atomic number for polonium. What is the atomic number for polonium, guys? Hmm? What is the uh, polonium is actually uh, atomic number is 84. Okay, so atomic number is 84. How do I know it is 84? I check the periodic table, of course. No one remember these things, okay? So check the periodic table and figure out the atomic number. Okay, so you need that information. And then they tell us that this is alpha decay, which means we are generating a helium 4 or helium 2 plus, I, I mean, radiation, right? Helium 2 plus radiation, so which is this one. And we have to predict the other product. We have to predict the other product okay so what we do is we try to uh, treat mass number and atomic number separately so let's do the mass number first let's do mass number first 
and in this side you have 214 in the reactant side you have 214 uh, which is equal to 4 plus the mass number of the unknown okay mass number of the unknown so what will be m okay it will be 210 okay so you will have a 210 as the mass number of the new species new new isotope and then let's do the atomic number let's do the atomic number and uh, atomic number is 84 in the reactant side and the product side you have a 2 and then the unknown let's call it a okay so you do the math and you figure out a which is 82 82 okay a is 82 so 82 is the atomic number now you go back to the periodic table and then uh, learn where the 82 is and then 82 is actually the atomic number of lead so you figure out the element symbol from the atomic number okay that is how you do it okay so you do the atomic number sum you figure out the atomic number which will basically give you the atom i mean element symbol and also you will do the mass number equation and you will figure out the mass number so your answer your answer is lead okay 210 that is your product that is your product. this is how you do it guys okay this is how you do it and you will write and balance the equation all right so let's talk about beta decay this is very similar to alpha decay by the way this is very similar to alpha decay only difference is that in here it is a beta decay so rather than getting an alpha particle you are getting a beta particle in products you are getting a beta particle in products okay so in this uh, radioactive re i mean re i mean this is in this uh, radioactive decay you are getting alpha particle as products okay so in here i have an example uh, using carbon 14 okay so radioactive or beta decay of carbon 14 beta decay of carbon 14 gets you nitrogen 14 and beta particles nitrogen 14 and beta particles okay all right so let's do an example okay i want you to try this sample problem without my help so pause the video and try it and then we will discuss the answer okay we will discuss the answer all right so let's talk about it what you have uh, is yttrium 90 what you have is yttrium 90 so you look at the periodic table and then figure out the atomic number for yttrium which is 39 you don't have to memorize them okay just use the periodic table and then figure out the atomic number okay so you have that and then it, it says that this reaction is a beta emitter or yttrium 90 is a beta emitter so you must get beta particles okay you must get beta particles and then something else right so let's do the atomic number part atomic number sum so 39 is the atomic number for the reactants and then products has a minus one and then let's say a as the unknown atomic number for your new species new isotope so a will be what a will be 40 a will be 40 okay so you look at the periodic table you look at the periodic table and you uh, figure out the atomic number 40 and then the atomic symbol will be what or the element symbol will be zirconium okay and then you will do the mass number you will do the mass number sum and then mass number for the reactants are 90 and products are 0 plus uh, let's call it m and what is the new mass number which is 90 in beta decay mass number is not changing so you don't even have to do any calculations but i mean if you don't want to remember that or understand that just do the math okay mass number sum uh, calculation so beta particles has zero mass number so therefore the mass number for the new isotope will still be the same mass number of your previous radioactive isotope which is 90 in this case all right so this is how you do it guys this is your answer okay so this is the balanced equation and the new species all right so um these are the answers i mean i already explained it but you can pause the video and then write it down if you have to 
All right, so let's let's do the nuclear balanced nuclear equation for beta decay of chromium 51. Okay. So what we have is chromium 51. If you got the previous one wrong, you must have to do this one correctly, okay? So chromium atomic number is 24. This is beta decay, of course. This is beta decay, so uh, the new species will have the atomic number of 25, which is manganese, okay? And then mass number is the same, 51. All right, so this is the equation, okay? So you will do the atomic number sum, okay? And then figure out the new atomic number. 25 minus one is 24 on both sides, okay? All right, and then 51 is the mass number and it is unchanged during beta decay. All right, so the, here's another uh, study check. You can try it uh, at home because I mean, I have taught you too. I think you can easily figure out this one. All right, so let's, let's Let's do positron emission, okay? This is the third kind that we are going to learn. I mean, now things are rhetorical, right? These are these should be automatic to you now. So in these reactions, you have a positron particle emitting from your reaction, okay? So uh, which is basically plus one for the charge and zero for the mass number. So based on that, you can adjust your calculations and figure out the equation, okay? And the gamma radiations are the last kind that, that is remaining. So gamma radiations have zero mass number and zero charge. So therefore, uh, if you look at the equation for gamma radiations, you will realize that the atomic number should not change and mass number should not change, right? So basically, uh, nothing changes when it comes to mass number and atomic number in the gamma emission. So in order to distinguish between the reactant uh, radioactive particle and the product uh, isotope, okay, what you do is we use a lowercase m. Okay, we use a lowercase m after the mass number. So this m means, you know, it is a high energy unstable radioactive isotope. Of course, after radiation, this m is gone. Okay, you no longer have the m. Okay, so that is, that is the only difference. Okay. But I mean, in gamma radiations, you don't have to do any calculations. Just simply remove this M from the reactant side, right? All right. With that, we are going to go to the summary of these radiations. So now you should be able to understand this summary. And uh, I'm not going to explain it again in more detail. Okay. So in every type of decay reaction, it could be alpha decay, beta decay, positron emission or gamma emission. You will get that respective radiation particle plus a new nucleus new nucleus okay and the new nucleus is dependent on the type of radiation emission okay type of radiation emission all right so now we are going to change gears and talk about something uh, new this is also similar to uh, balancing nuclear radiation reactions the discussion that we had before for radiation emissions but in here what we do is we are going to produce radioactive isotopes okay we are going to produce radioactive isotopes so we are going to start with a stable isotope okay something like you know in this example i have boron 10 boron 10 is a stable isotope so you are going to start with a stable isotope and then you are going to shoot or we call it bombard okay you are going to bombard a, a stable isotope with some radiation. In here, we are bombarding boron 10 with uh, alpha particles. It is like, you know, you have, let's say you have a dog. I mean, don't take it literally, okay? Just for an example, you have a dog, a stray dog, let's say, uh, laying on the ground, okay, minding his own business and someone throwing a rock at him, okay? So you are bombarding a rock at the dog and then the dog was very stable before he was laying on the ground, doing nothing, minding his own business. But immediately when you throw the rock at him, it, the dog will get excited, right? So basically dog is our stable isotope before, now it is excited. So now it is unstable, okay? So you are producing a new unstable uh, radioactive isotope, plus you might get some radiation out of, out of it as well, depending on the reaction, okay? So you take a stable isotope, 
you bombard it with a radiation and then you immediately generate a new radioactive nucleus plus or new radioactive isotope plus some other type of radiation okay this process is also known as transmutation transmutation in here you are generating new radioactive isotopes uh, you, uh, through bombarding with a small uh, radiation particle all right with a small radiation particle so everything else is just like what we did before okay so balancing uh, equations and figuring out the new type of isotope or the new radiation that you get is just like before you will treat the atomic number and the mass number separately and you will try to balance the atomic number sum of the reactants to atomic number sum of products or the mass number of reactants and mass number of products just like before in here as you can see what we have is a nickel 50, 58 isotope okay we are bombarding this is a very stable one nickel 58 is stable isotope and you are bombarding it with a proton we are bombarding it with a proton so in here uh, the reactant side the reactant side the the atomic number atomic number sum is 29 1 plus 28 is 29 okay and then your product side has two from the alpha particles plus let's call it x the atomic number of the new radioactive species so x will be how much x will be 27 okay so you are getting uh, an isotope with the atomic number of 27 you look at the periodic table and it will be cobalt it will be cobalt okay and then you look at the mass number sum in the reactant side the mass number sum is 59 58 plus 1 is 59 and in the product side you only have 4 you need 55 more to make 59 right so you are generating a radioactive cobalt 55 in this reaction you are generating a radioactive cobalt 55 in this reaction so here's the breakdown of my calculations if you want to pause the video and write it down but i think this is very self-explanatory right now okay so this is what we generate as the new species all right just to practice this let's try this study check really quickly by now you should be able to do it in like a second or two okay i mean at least within a minute of course uh, what you have is a technetium 98 okay all right so figure out uh, what what is going to be the new radioactive isotope what is going to be the new uh, radioactive isotope all right so let's do this all right so in the atomic number side in the atomic number side reactants have the sum of 43 and in the product side you only have two so the unknown let's call it a it should be what 41 it should be 41 so what we have is nb okay our new species is nb niobium okay 41 and you do the mass number calculations uh, in in the product side you have 99 and the sorry in the reactant side you have 99 and the product side you have 4 plus let's call it m as the unknown mass number 4 the nb okay so you do, do the calculation and you figure out m which is 95 okay 95 so write 95 so this will be the unknown uh, radioactive isotope that we generate from this reaction okay are we clear all right, so now I'm actually going to uh, speed up our discussion just to make this video slow. Okay, I have some slides on your on your lecture on radioactive measurements and especially talks about Geiger counter. Geiger counter is the instrument that we usually use to measure radiations. Okay, so the work, how it works is also given here briefly so if you want more details i would recommend that you you at least watch a youtube video on how geiger, geiger counter works okay and also in here i have units of measuring radiations okay so i recommend that you guys read through the next uh, this slide and the next slide okay so basically uh, it is important that you know what type of rate units that we use to measure radiations okay and uh, usually we use something called rem okay rem is radiation equivalent in humans okay you use rem to measure biological effects of radiation types okay 
So REM is usually used to measure the biological effects of different types of radiation. Okay. And uh, in the next, I mean, please read the slide through it and it will basically explain you different type of radiations and their impact. Okay. And also radioactivity. So just glance through this. This is also could be important. Okay. But I'm more interested in uh, the next few slides. And we are going to wrap up this video as soon as possible so just pay attention to few more minutes and we will be done okay in here uh, I really like this slide mainly because uh, it, it tells it gives you an idea about the exposure to radiation uh, uh, through our uh, different daily activities okay so basically every day we are exposed to radiations to some extent okay remember we measure biological impact of radiations using rems but in this table we are using millirems okay millirems is a uh, thousand times smaller than rems okay millirems m-r-e-m -E okay so usually uh, average annual radiation received by a person in the united states uh, uh, is given in millirems in this table okay so by ground air and water you are usually getting about 20 to 30 radiations every year millirems okay you, you are getting 20 30 millirems every year uh, cosmic rays about 40 millirems wood concrete brick they are basically 50 millirems okay and most people are really scared about getting x-rays okay so this basically gives you an idea about the amount of radiations that each x-ray contains okay so you don't have to really be worried about getting an x-ray some people are really nervous about getting x-rays whenever they are sick sick because they don't want to get exposed to radiations i understand the concern but it, the radiations are not that high i mean it is like you know each each uh, x-ray is basically reducing your life by one year i'm just kidding okay uh, I, why did i say that it is reducing your lifespan by one year because you know usually x-ray has radiations that are equal to the radiations that you get from the ground or from your atmosphere within one year okay so you are getting uh, one x-ray basically gives you the radiation dose of one year of exposure to let's say uh, your natural environment okay but some x-rays could could give you high doses of x-rays so uh, if you are really worried you might want to you know well, learn that okay certain radi certain x-rays could expose you to more radiation especially upper gastrointestinal tract x-rays could expose you to high radiations okay all right <clears throat> and uh i i actually kind of uh, feels that the next uh, uh thing is really funny because nuclear power plants okay gives you the lowest amount of radiation so, so let's say you know you are a worker who is working in a radio uh, plant or nuclear power, power plant okay so you are not even getting exposed to radiations as much as you know a, an average person okay people when they are living outside they will get 30 40 millirems of radiation from from nature right but you are not getting at least you know you are getting like 100 times less radiation than that even more okay even even less so why i mean the that is because these nuclear power plants are well controlled when it comes to radiations so you are getting exposed to these radiations to a very little extent okay and that is of course until there is something wrong and there is a leak okay just kidding but anyway these uh, power plants have very low amounts of radiations because they are controlled uh, televisions around 20 air travel 10 okay so these are some of the things that you might want to you know remember okay but just have a rough idea don't memorize the numbers okay don't memorize the numbers and uh, i really like the next uh, table in radiation sickness slide okay it basically talks about the lethal dose of radiation for some life we call it ld50 okay ld50 is a general term that is used to identify the lethal dose of a particular substance okay you are drugs have a lethal dose okay let's say you know if you talk about a cancer drug it has a lethal dose value okay lethal dose means you know uh, lethal dose 50 means the amount of chemical or the dose that you need to kill 50 percent of the population 50 percent of the population if you are a cancer drug okay you need to have a 
smaller LD50 value. Why? Because by using a smaller dose, you can kill as many as cancer cells you want. Okay. So if you if you if you are thinking about a cancer drug, LD50 smaller than LD50 value, the better the drug is. Why? Because you have to give a smaller dose. Or oh, it is very toxic. Uh, in here, radiation. When it comes to radiation, this LD50 value means you know the radiation that a certain type of population needs to have 50% uh, population, you know, vanish from the planet, I guess, right? So to kill 50% of the population. So humans, they only need what? Of 500 grams uh, to kill half the human population. Okay, if you, ha if you are exposed to 500 grams of radiation, half the population is dead. I mean, if you see, I mean, dogs and cats, usually these small uh, animals have a smaller LD50 value. That means, you know, they die before us. Okay, so let's say you are, you are, you are living close to, um, this is a joke, okay? Don't take it literally. If you are living close to a nuclear power plant, you won't have a cat or a dog, okay? Why? Because, you know, if your cat dies for no reason, that is when you have to pack up and leave, okay? Because, you know, they, their LD50 value is smaller than us. That means, you know, they die uh, to a lower dose than us, okay? But if you take a look at these insects, bacteria, and rats, they have a very high... Uh, LD50 value. That means, you know, you need to have a very huge dose of radiation to kill 50% of the population. If something goes wrong and everyone dies on Earth, every human dies on Earth uh, from some radiation uh, mishap, let's say, you know, the Earth will be crowded with bacteria, insects, and even with rats, okay? So, just something, you know, to remember. <laughs> anyway, uh, I want you to try this study check at home, okay, and see if you could figure this one out because I'm not going to explain this. It is self-explanatory, okay, so try this by yourself and let me know if you have any questions or if you need to, if you need me to explain it. The last thing that we are going to talk about is half-life, okay, half-life of a radioactive isotope. This is an important thing because every radioactive isotope has a half-life, okay, every radioactive isotope has a half-life. And what is half-life? Half-life is basically the time it takes. I mean, you know, radioactive isotopes are always emitting radiation and then becoming more stable, right? So with time, these radioactive isotopes should be stable, non-radioactive isotopes, right? So basically, if you have an X amount of radioactive isotope, uh, it will become half the population in a certain time because of the radioactive decay, right? So half-life is the time it takes to decrease or reduce the radioactive isotope population by half, by half. So let's say you have 20 milligrams. In this example, I have uh, a radioactive isotope, ID-131, 20 milligrams of it. And uh, after one half-life, you know, you only have half uh, of the radioactive iodine-131, which means 10 milligrams, okay? So half, after one half life, the radioactive isotope population should be decreased by half, okay? After two ha half lives, then, you know, this amount will also be halved, okay? So the decay is exponential, okay? The decay is exponential, okay? So it, it kind of looks like this, okay? So after each half life, you are your isotope level goes down by half it goes down by half okay so this is this is a decay curve okay this is a decay curve for a radioactive isotope in here it is the id-131 and in this slide uh, it is listing some of the very common uh, radioactive isotopes and their half-life and uh, one of the very common radioactive isotopes for medical purposes are iodine and things like you know chromium Okay, so usually the isotopes that are given medically to your body have a shorter, shorter uh, uh, half-life. That means, you know, they are going to go or reduce their population in your, inside your body very easily, okay? Some have like, you know, a few days, like, you know, iodine has only eight days. And certain isotopes only have like a very short, like technetium. 99 has a six hour half life that means after every six hour it is the population of technetium is going to be halved okay halved so 
If you are using a radioactive isotope medically, you should use a radioactive isotope with a shorter uh, half life. So after after few days, you know, most of the radioactive isotopes will be converted to uh, stable isotopes, and then they are not going to be uh, harmful to you for a longer period of time. Okay, and uh, uh, and also in this table, I have some uh, radioactive isotopes that are found naturally. Okay, things like carbon, potassium, and uranium. Okay, as you can see, they have very long uh, uh, lifespans. Things like carbon. Okay, uh, it has a half life of five thousand seven hundred and thirty. Okay, so uh, carbon is an ideal isotope to uh, date uh, fossils or rocks. Why? Because their half life is so. Uh, long, I mean, they they can uh, be used to determine uh, the uh, the age of things. Okay, so usually radioactive labeling or dating techniques, radioactive dating techniques can use uh, things like carbon dating because they have a very long half life. So most of the radioactive carbons are still there in in the rocks or old materials that we can find on on our Earth. Okay, all right. <clears throat> Look at uranium. Uranium has a very, very, la very large half life. Okay. Uranium has a very, very large half life. So most of the uranium that we had from the start of the planet Earth is still there. Okay. Is still there because you know it has a very long half life. All right. So now we are going to try to do uh, uh, some calculations using the half lives i mean there is a stepwise breakdown on how to do these half life calculations but let me explain you how to do this uh, by using an example in here what we have is a strontium 90 okay we have a strontium 90 and then its half life is 38.1 years okay so the things that you need for these calculations are half life let's call it t half for strontium 90 it is 38.1 years okay and also the other thing that we need is the amount the starting amount okay uh, so in here the initial amount is what 36 milligrams okay you you had uh, 36 milligrams of strontium 90 and also you need the time span how how how, how much time it has how, how how much time has passed okay the the amount of amount of time that has passed uh, those are the only three things that we need so basically the time uh, how many milligrams will, so yeah how many milligrams will remain after 152.4 years has passed so we have those three informations right so we need the half life we need the starting uh, starting mass or the starting amount of your radioactive isotope okay and then of course the 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 time time span okay which is 152.4 so when when doing these calculations what you do is you want to first figure out how many half lives has spent during the time span okay so what you do is you take the uh, 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 total time which is 152 you take the total time and you divide it by the number of, I mean, the half-life. Okay, you take the time and you divide it by T-half. Okay, and you get the number of half-lives spent. Okay, for this uh, strontium, uh, we, have, we have gone past four half-lives, right? So, then what you do is you take the original starting amount of um, strontium and then you start dividing it by two until you spend four half lives so after one half life you only have 18 after two half lives you only have nine after three you have 4.5 and after four half lives which is the one that we are interested you only have 2.2 milligrams of strontium 2.2 milligrams of strontium okay so basically you calculate the the number of half lives spent and then you divide the initial uh, radioactive amount uh, isotope amount by two for every half life spent okay hope that is clear and then i have a small calculation for you to try okay uh, in this uh, slide so try this at home okay this should be very easy for you okay so i have given you the half life i have given you the times spent 
okay so which is basically 26 hours so it is only what two half lives okay you divide t by t half which is basically 26 hours by 13 so it has only spent two half lives right two t halves okay so you, you started with 40 64 milligrams you started with 64 milligrams after one half life it will be 32 milligrams and after another half life it will be how much 16 milligrams okay so the answer will be b answer will be b all right all right guys that's it for me okay let me know if you have any questions hope you enjoyed the lesson let me know if you have any questions okay just you guys have a nice one okay take care